Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, this is a pre recorded session this week as I am traveling. So, if you do have any questions, if you're joining us on Zoom, just reply to the confirmation email that you got uh, when you registered for the class or the reminder email. You can, that'll go to our inbox and I'll answer those questions. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, just uh, make sure you leave a comment and I'll get to those. Or if you're watching on Facebook, just leave a comment under the video as well and I'll get to those when I return. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-On's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last, oh, 11 years or so. Traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-On. So I had about 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced, in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru, so worked in a dealership, and I guess over time became that default diag guy in the shop. So I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my bag. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is continuing with our OEM specific training series where we focus on just one brand for the entire class. Uh, and this week we are talking about GM, General Motors as a as a whole. So, you know, Chevy, uh, uh, Chevy Buick, uh, Cadillac, etc. So let's start off as we usually do with the history. We'll go back to uh, the early 1900s. So uh, General Motors as a corporation, was founded in 1908 as a holding company. And that's the same time roundabout when they acquired Buick and Olds Motor Works, which would become uh, Oldsmobile. In 1909, they acquired multiple companies, including Cadillac, as well as the predecessors to Pontiac and GMC. So they already had a lot of these companies under their umbrella before they even got uh, to World War I. Founded Chevrolet in 1919, so that was actually one of the last ones to the party. And then GMAC, which was their financing arm for a long time, uh, was also founded in 1919 at the same time. Now, they created the first production turbocharged vehicle in 1962 with the Oldsmobile Cutlass Turbo Jetfire. In 1971, they offered the first vehicles with ABS. The 1973 Olds Tornado was the first production vehicle with a passenger's airbag. Uh, so those are a lot of the firsts, right, coming up and through the uh, the 80s and so on, up until uh, 2004 when Oldsmobile was then discontinued. And then, of course, after the economic downturn in 2008 or so, uh, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2009. Uh, going out of that bankruptcy, they sold off Hummer, Pontiac, Saab, and Saturn, which they had under their umbrella. So they got rid of all those. And at present which would be 2024 right now. GM covers Chevrolet, GMC, Buick, and Cadillac in North America. Uh, they do have some other holdings in other parts of the world, but that's all we're going to talk about today is Chevy, GMC, Buick, and Cadillac. A few of the top models. So we went by, uh, by sales rank, of course, through the last 10 years or so, 2013 to 2023. And we can see if you're uh, over in North America, uh, no surprise to you that the Silverado would be their top selling model. It was 59, uh, 5 million, almost 6 million uh, vehicles. And then also the Sierra coming in third. So if you were to add those two together, that's uh, almost 9 million uh, trucks uh, sold between the Silverado and the Sierra. Uh, next one's the Equinox. And then, of course, going down the list all the way down to the Colorado, which is uh, almost 900,000. Um, so total of 19 million vehicles sold out of those top 10 uh, from 2013 to, actually it's more than 10. Yeah, it's top 10. Uh, from 2013 to 2023. So we picked a few representative models as we always do, just to kind of pick up where were there, where, what should be the largest number of these on the road out of that 10 year span? Where do they have the most sales? Uh, so 2015 was kind of the high water mark for the Silverado and Sierra. Uh, so as far as that is concerned, it is the third generation of those vehicles. They were offered with a 4.3, 5.3, 6 liter, 6.2 liter gas engines, and of course a 6.6 .6 liter Duramax diesel on the uh, HD models. 
six speed and eight speed automatic transmissions, as well as a six speed Allison transmission that was offered with the diesel engines only. Also, the 2015 heavy duty models, so the 2500 and 3500, were the first to offer active cruise control and forward collision warning systems in a pickup. So, another first there for that. Next one down the line is going to be the 2019 Equinox GMC, uh, Chevy Equinox GMC Terrain Combo. Uh, this is the third generation. It's kind of a midsize SUV. Uh, 1.5 liter, 2 liter gas, and 1.6 liter diesel engines were offered in those years. Uh, Six-speed and nine-speed automatic transmission. And this was the last year the diesel engine was offered. And also the Buick Envision shares this same platform. So that, that's kind of a theme across a lot of manufacturers nowadays. But GM is definitely really good at it. It's having one platform across multiple brands that they just kind of build everything on and put it. It's, you know, it's a rolling chassis, powertrain, and then they just throw a body on top of it, depending on you know what the design needs to be. So it saves them a lot of uh, effort in production. And then another uh, another good representative would be a 2016 Malibu. This was a uh, you know good high water mark year for that. Uh, ninth generation of the Malibu at that point. 1.5 liter, 2 liter, and 2.5 liter gas engines were available. 1.8 liter hybrid powertrain was also available for that. Uh, six speed and eight speed automatic transmissions. It was the first year teen driver feature was offered where the parents could uh, set parameters and kind of keep tabs on what their children were doing as they're driving their vehicle. And this was also the first year of that having a hybrid powertrain offered as well. Some common issues across the board. And as I said, you know, a lot, a lot of the same engines are used and a lot of the same transmissions are used across the board. Uh, so a lot of these common issues can be fairly common across the whole range because of that shared uh, ecosystem there. Uh, so intake system issues, you're going to see a lot of codes referencing that. Uh, turbos, you know, intake valve issues, things like that. Uh, thermostat and cooling system issues, you're going to see a lot of those pop up. Trucks have a lot of AC condenser issues. You're going to see this when we go to our top 10 lists and so on. A um, lot, of, lot of replacements on those condensers. I think it's just because of where they are and kind of the, 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 the design may be a little bit flawed as well. And uh, pin tension on harness connectors. We see that come up an awful lot. A lot of service bulletins on that, uh, where it's, you know, the, the pins will get a little loose. Maybe they'll get corroded, something like that. Uh, and then that can lead to electrical problems in the vehicle. So I saw a lot of those pop up as well. Common codes. So this is based on our scan tools. You know, what are the most common codes that people are seeing when it comes to General Motors vehicles? So we can see a lot of... Uh, fair number of Malibus and those 1.5 liter engines. And then also those 1.4 liter engines in the cruise, fair number of codes there. But we can see, as I said, a lot of intake issues. So P1101, one, two, three, four different times across two different engines. And that is intake airflow system performance. Uh, we have a coolant thermostat there again. Lost communication with HVAC control module. That's kind of high because this is out of our top 3,000 some odd codes. So on a uh, on a 5.3 liter 2018 Silverado, a lot of those. Uh, engine underboost, that's kind of an intake thing too for the turbo. Uh, brake system, intake air flow again, catalyst efficiency, system too lean. So once again, we get some mixture problems there. Cat codes are fairly common you know, just anywhere in the world right now. But uh, that was kind of interesting how we have multiple instances of that intake air flow system performance. Some OEM specific features that maybe set GM apart from other manufacturers. Uh, they do displacement on demand. Now, other manufacturers also do displacement on demand, Honda's being one of them, but they do it a little bit differently than anybody else. So one version of it, one variety, is they have the, the lifters have oil pressure and there's a little spring in here. So the push rod can be pushed either higher or lower in this chamber, depending on where the oil is. So in this case, we got a little spring in there. Uh, at its default state, it's going to push that push rod up. And then when the oil flows to the, uh, the lifter, it'll then push the spring in on either side. And then it makes that push rod push down. And then it won't be pushing the, the rocker anymore. And that essentially shuts off, the, um, shuts off that cylinder because the valves aren't open. 
Now, in that case as well, due to this, see a lot of lifter issues with these as well. So uh, maybe getting a lot of stuck lifters, lifter replacements prematurely more, more often than you would normally. Uh, and that's just due to the way that that is designed. There is also a uh, kind of a newer version of this too. It's called dynamic skip fire. So they can actually change uh, whether or not all the cylinders are firing uh, as they go in it dynamically, as it's as it's said in the name. Um, so it can change the torque profile as the vehicle is going down the road. Um, so they call that dynamic skip fire. They selectively fire cylinders depending on the need of the engine. Another thing that is a, a little unique to GM, I don't I, I don't think it's a hundred percent they're the only ones, but it is very unique is the brake pedal position sensor. Um so what that does is the brake pedal position sensor has two position sensors which send signal voltage to the engine control module and the body control module. The main purpose of the BPPS is to alert other drivers behind the vehicle. The vehicle is braking and slowing down, so turning on the brake lights. Modules receive the analog signals are in communication with other systems through the uh, land data communication lines that help with cruise control exit strategies, transmission control, shift strategies, ECM monitor drive cycle ex exit strategies, and more. Uh, so it takes this information, uses it in multiple modules. Uh, down here in the tech notes is what makes this, I guess, kind of a little unique. So the brake pedal position sensor calibration is performed after the sensor, body control module, or ECM are serviced. The BPP sensor signal and BCM data display should be less than a tenth of a volt. If not, perform the calibration procedure. And the main purpose of the calibration is to set the home value of the BPS at rest with the foot off the brake pedal. Modules in communication will use the signal to determine the driver's brake pedal application. But uh, what you do need to do, which it doesn't say in this particular paragraph, but uh, to calibrate it, you, all, you have to calibrate it in the BCM and the ECM both separately. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work correctly. So you have to uh, go into each module individually and do it that way. Or you can also go into, depending on what tool you have, if you have one of our tools with the service resets and relearns menu, you can go in there and it actually pulls them both in the same screen at the same time, which is very handy. Also, not 100% unique, as I said, with GM, but uh, they do have a oxygen sensor heater circuit that learns uh, variable resistance. So as the resistance changes, as the oxygen sensor ages, the computer learns to increase the amount of current flow to that oxygen sensor heater in order to get it to heat up the same as it did when it was new. Problem is, it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up, and then eventually that sensor is going to fail for one reason. When it does fail, you're going to put in a brand new sensor, and the brand new sensor is going to expect a lower level of current. It's going to be receiving a much higher level of current, and usually what happens is all the magic smoke comes out. So you're going to overcurrent, you know, provide excess current to the oxygen sensor heater circuit. It's going to end up blowing it up. So it actually says in here, right there, right at the top, when you're placing an oxygen sensor, perform the following. A code clear with the scan tool, regardless of whether or not a DTC is set. And then also HO2S heater resistance learn reset with a scan tool where available. Perform the above in order to reset the oxygen sensor resistance learn value and avoid possible oxygen sensor failure. So there you go, straight from GM. And that is in the tool. It's been in there since 2006 model year. So it's been around for a while. Now we'll get on to tips from a tech. So this is from uh, this is what where we try to get that institutional knowledge from other technicians. You know that weird stuff that you might not think of if you don't normally work on this brand, right? So maybe you're a European tech and you've only worked on Volkswagens the whole time, and then a then a, a Chevy rolls in the shop and you're expected to fix it. Well, if it's got a weird problem that you might not have seen before, or there are some things in here that we're going to talk about that are kind of a uh, be aware of when you're working on this, even at some routine things, um, it might not necessarily be as straightforward as you would expect. And that's why we try to gather this information to try and help everybody out, you know, as we go through this. So the first one, this has been a, uh, a hot topic for a few years um, because uh, this can cause issues with the vehicle for sure. So this is 18 through 23 Equinox and Terrain. Uh, brake service. And what happens is the vehicle may present with a code, a C code, chassis code, 
Uh, service park brake message in the driver information center and the park brake will not learn after a rear brake service is performed. Uh, if the first steps of rear brake service instructions are not followed, this may result. The brake fluid level in the master cylinder reservoir must be at half or lower to allow sufficient space for the fluid to return to the reservoir when the rear caliper retract is commanded. So you command it with a scan tool and it'll retract them. Um, the caliper will retract when commanded, but will stop when the reservoir is full. So the piston may not fully be retracted in the caliper, depending on how much you have. If the piston is then manually pressed the rest of the way, which I'm sure some people will do, so the caliper can be reinstalled, the excess fluid pressure will damage the pressure sensor in the electronic brake control module, and it will cause the electronic brake control module to fail, and the only repair is to replace it. Due to the nature of this damage, it is not under warranty, and uh, af aftermarket tools can cause this issue as well. Um, we have had quite a few calls in the customer care center saying, hey, your scan tool broke my car. Well, it's not the scan tool. Sorry to tell you, it's not the scan tool's fault. It's actually the GM tool would do the same exact thing. It's actually, if you want to blame anybody, I blame GM for making it that fragile, but uh, you know, kind of is what it is. So it's something you need to be aware of on these vehicles. If you're doing a rear brake service, make sure that that fluid level is below half when you're going to retract the calipers. I would, I'd say even less because maybe you might want to service the brake fluid at the same time, right? So it's just so we're not buying a new electronic brake control module because we cause it to fail, right? So that's, I say that just that one tip right there, that's going to save a ton of headaches for some people. Uh, another one. So this is, um, so this is on wheel, ba wheel bearings, right? So on a, on a wheel speed sensor on, uh, Acadia's. So on some vehicles, the following DTCs or symptom codes may set a bunch of C codes. In addition, the following lights may be illuminated ABS service track control system and or service stability track. This may be caused by bits of ferrous magnetic debris stuck to the wheel speed sensor magnetic encoder ring. These vehicles use a speed sensor encoder ring with north-south magnetic pole pieces encased in a nitrile rubber ring, typically brown in color. This ring is a part of the wheel bearing. So in the wheel bearing, in order for it to sense the wheel speed, it has that encoder ring, which has a bunch of magnets in it. And what does it say? Ferrous, um, ferrous material, ferrous magnetic debris. So ferrous means iron, iron and magnets, you know, they, they stick together. So if experiencing any of these symptoms, the ring may be cleaned using a soft nylon brushable toothbrush or equivalent. If any debris still remains, a mild soap detergent may be used, wipe dry, use care to prevent damage to the wheel bearing seal. It's important not to use any kind of magnetic tool to remove this debris or the encoder may be damaged. So if I first thing to think of, oh, there's a bunch of metal on here, metal shavings. I'm just going to use my magnet to pick it up. It's going to screw up the magnets inside the encoder. So we don't want to do that. And then GM has this really excellent picture of what that might look like that is like seriously photoshopped if you ask me but uh that's kind of the the gist of what you're going to be trying to find you're going to find some uh rust things of that nature sitting in here uh metal flaking etc in there and it's gonna you know, kind of it's gonna cause the sensor not to read the wheel bearing now of course we could also check before we take things apart and see how well it's reading by using got a component test as well uh, so this is an example of what a guided component test would look like on a good one. Doesn't have any dropouts. It would look all, it, you, you might get some fuzziness. You might have some lower uh, looking square waves in there as well. And it's really high level uh, talk about this, but uh, you could actually go in there, use guided component test to verify that as well. Uh, here's another one that uh, technicians gave to me as well. So this is on a, um, Diesel. These are on the diesel uh, Silverados and Sierras, uh, L5P, L5D engines. Uh, and you could have multiple codes, uh, fuel rail, low pressure, fuel pressure regulator, injection quantity too low, fuel pressure regulator, etc. All these different codes could be caused by the electrical connector on the fuel pressure sensor, uh, fuel pressure sensor electrical connector. So we can see right there, maybe necessary to use a terminal test kit with dielectric grease on it to apply and drag each terminal a few times. So that's pin tension in that. So if we do have a problem with that, they actually sell that as a separate harness connector, which usually means that they actually have a problem with it. There's the terminal test tool as well. 
So you actually go in, you have some pin issues, and then it would cause a code on these on these trucks. And if you would go through it normally, I believe you end up doing something else that is not uh, related to that, and it end up causing uh, you know other problems down the road. So that's just a few off the top, uh, a few different things. I I, th I think a couple of those are definitely not intuitive if you don't work on them. Now for some uh, OEM specific scan tool functions that we have in here as well. So uh, a couple engine related tests. So for example, crank position variation learn. Uh, that's not 100% unique, but just kind of the way it works is different than other manufacturers. EVAP service bay test, that one's very common. And uh, it also requires definitely certain parameters to be followed in order to make that happen. Oxygen sensor heater learn, like we said, not 100% unique, but there's only a couple brands that do it. Uh, brake pedal position sensor learn, for sure, you got to go into two different modules. And automated injector balance tests. There's, there's other injector balance tests on other manufacturers, but just the way that that one works for GM is unique to how it would work for other manufacturers. Uh, transmission related tests. Uh, one good example is a fast learn adapt process. So instead of taking a longer time to relearn adaptations after transmission work, this is a fast learn. Uh, other tests that are, uh, for example, and these seem to be brake uh, related, automated brake, automated brake bleed, and then the rear caliper piston retract and extend, and that kind of relates to the Equinox, right? You want to make sure that um, there is less than half a master cylinder full in there. All right, let's go live on the tool and let's see what we can find for some of these specific functions. Uh, what we can find for sure track real world information as well for sure so let's go in first one i want to do is the silverado okay so we'll go in here and we'll see like if we go into engine for example functional tests you have the automated automated injector balance evap service bay tests crank variation learn cam actuator tests as well for variable valve timing, cylinder power balance tests, uh, different uh, output controls as well, compression tests. Uh, there's that brake pedal position sensor learn in the engine. Uh, cylinder deactivation for the uh, displacement on demand as well as in there. Uh, fuel trim resets, definitely necessary. Oxygen sensor re relearn is in here too, right there. Oxygen sensor heater learn. Um, so a lot of different things available in there. Uh, as well as a wealth of data. Uh, if we were to go to our SureTrack. This is one of my favorite things to do if I'm looking at a new vehicle that I haven't worked on for a while or something like that. Uh, if we go in here, we can see 795,053 repairs on this particular year, year model and engine. Uh, so normal stuff as usual, disc brake pads and rotors, there's AC refrigerant, there's a condenser. Right? Like I said, a lot of condenser issues on the trucks and the SUVs, the full-size ones. 43,000 repairs out of these. Uh, and then if we go to symptoms, AC and op is the number one symptom that goes in there. Uh, and then here we have condenser and condenser spelled a slightly different way as far as people, what are people plugging in this box. So a lot of condenser issues. We come down here, misfire is the number one code on that. Then we get the coolant thermostat. Remember we talked about that. EVAP, CAP, too rich. Uh, transmission control system, pressure control solenoid on the transmission, cold start revital, torque converter. So we can see quite a few different codes on that. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of common problems there. And like I said, the condenser. Let me see if there's a, let's check real quick. Let's see if there is a, no bulletins on it so yeah definitely a uh, definitely an issue let's look at part uh let's see without aux battery battery it's an hour and it's like 200 bucks for so that's not terrible uh, considering how many need to be replaced i guess <laughs> that's uh, not awful all right uh next one let's go to an equinox okay we'll come in here 
And uh, in this case, you're going to have a lot of the same engine stuff because, like I said, they, they like to share a lot of the different things across the board, the automated engine ejector balance, EVAP service bay test, crank variation learn. Uh, those are going to be very common. Uh, we can go back here. Uh, quick, quick way to get to that, say, that brake pedal position relearn. We go into service resets and relearns if you have a tool that has that capability on it. Uh, that sorts out all of the different controls, functional tests, that sort of thing by job. So if I were to scroll down here to brakes and go to the brake pedal position sensor, um, I can pull it up here, functional resets. And it's going to see at one for the uh, body control module and the one for the engine control module there on the same screen. So I can simply go in there, do the learn procedure, hit learn, done. And I can go to the other one, hit learn, done. Simple as that. Same thing with the uh, oxygen sensor as well. That's in here. Instead of having to sort through all the different things in order to, to find it, where is it? Is it an output controls or whatever? I can go to oxygen sensor, go to my resets, and then there is my HO2S heater resistance learned value reset. They call it something different depending on the year, but it's the same exact thing. You just go in here, hit reset. All right, super simple. Let's go to um, sure track information. All right, come in here and we can see in this case, the two liter engine was not the most common engine here, 14,586 repairs. Number one code, uh, lean condition, then we have thermostat, misfire, uh, brake booster pressure sensor. So let's change the engine. Oops. Go to uh, the 1.5, I think it's the most popular. All right. Yeah, 68,000 repairs on that one. So same thing, pads, rotors, tire pressure monitoring system. That's kind of high up there. Valve stems, tire pressure sensors. That seems like a high failure rate too. AC refrigerant is still pretty up there. Uh, let's go over here. Misfire, oxygen sensors, system too lean, turbocharger, oxygen sensor, misfire. Again, a lot of misfires, a lot of crank. Cam and crank position, that's the variable valve timing systems. Uh, noise heard from brakes, engine doesn't start. And then uh, brake rotors again. Cabin air filter is usually pretty high on this particular list. Hey, there's that 1101 code. Oh, there it is again right there, that intake performance. All right, so 139 instances of that on that Equinox. And then finally, let's go with the Malibu. Malibu's going to once again have the same... A lot of the same uh, same things in there. Engine, whether it's automatic or manual. So you know, throttle sweep, automated injector balance, EVAP service bay test again. Multiple output controls in there. Thing with thing with GM is they're they're just kind of they're just they're a car. They're not overly complex. There, there's a lot of complexity starting to come into them, um, but a not a not a lot of that unique complexity other than like the brake pedal position sensor and a couple of the other things that I mentioned. I'll just pop in the transmission real quick too. Uh, transmission solenoid performance test. There's that fast learn add app process, etc. So um, they're just kind of a fairly simple to work on, I guess. They have a lot of common problems just because there's so many shared components across the board. Uh, 1.5 liter engine on this Malibu, uh, pads and rotors, of course, tire pressure monitoring system. Like I said, that seems awfully high. P1101 is the number one code on that. Uh, throttle pe uh, pedal position sensor, that seems abnormally high as well. Uh, usually you don't see a lot of throttle and pedal position sensor codes, so that seems like there may be an issue on that. Let's see real quick if there is a bullet. Oh, look at that. So let's go with... I guess. Uh, instrument panel harness. There we go. That's why. Does have an instrument panel harness. Inspect for water leak in the area. Uh, so I guess they must have water intrusion and harness issues with that. Because usually they're not, most manufacturers are not going to put out a bulletin unless that, that solves the problem in the majority of the instances. Uh, some more cam timing, throttle pedal position sensor. That's probably related, I would guess. Uh, turbocharger, engine doesn't start. Uh, there's that P1101 again for the number one code in there. So yeah, a lot of common commonality between the different 
even the different engines on these and the different models and years for sure. So that is General Motors. Hopefully you picked up a few little tips and tricks, tidbits that'll help you out in your day as you're going through working on these vehicles. If you haven't worked on too many of them, um, hopefully you picked up a few tips on that. So let's talk about next week. All right, so next week we are going to be talking about air conditioning testing and diagnosis. So as of right now in North America, we are in April and uh, it is getting into air conditioning season, especially in the South, it's starting to warm up. And then and then uh, in the North will be warm in no time. Trust me, we'll get there. Uh, so we're going to talk about AC systems, critical charge systems, hybrid, uh, different types of refrigerant, 134 versus 1234YF. Um, different control systems, different sensors that may affect it as well, both inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. And we'll talk about how we might be able to diagnose a few of the problems, maybe from the driver's seat, because we do have pressure sensors on the vehicle. So uh, join me hopefully next week. Same time as always, every Tuesday, 6 to 9 Eastern, snapon.com slash OT if you want to register and join on Zoom. Otherwise, the 6 p.m. Eastern class goes to YouTube at youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics. And the 9 p.m. Eastern class goes to my Facebook page, facebook.com slash snap on Jason, all one word, no dash and snap on. All right, as far as any of the other classes in this series, so anywhere from ADOS to reflashing and anything in between, you can go to the YouTube channel. There is a playlist for those classes. They're free. They're all about half an hour, 40 minutes long. If you scan that QR code, it'll actually take you to the page and then automatically subscribe you as well. So you can kind of do that a little one-stop shop. And make it a little easier on you. So, like I said, free, readily available for you. Uh, questions, as far as questions are concerned, as I said, this is pre-recorded this week as I'm traveling. So, if you do have any questions on Zoom, just uh, reply to the email that you got for confirmation. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment under the video. And if you're watching on Facebook, leave a comment. Also, want to make sure I mention my buddy Keith, who also does free diagnostics training every Wednesday and Thursday. So on Wednesday, it is on Zeus and Zeus Plus, and on Thursday, it is on Apollo and Triton Tools. And this is going to be the here, let's learn how to use your tool better. So the first hour is going to be, let's set up your Wi-Fi, make sure that's working, uh, talk about security link, talk about Snap-on cloud service, uh, talk about a few other setup functions on the tool. And then uh, it'll go through code to completion, scanner functions, fast track intelligent diagnostics. That's about an hour for that section. Then he'll take about a five minute break. And then after the break, it's all about guided component tests and lab scope and scope and meter functions on the respective tools. Uh, definitely worth your time. It's about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. And it's Zoom only, kind of designed to have the tool in front of you so you can watch what Keith's doing on the screen. Follow along on your own tool. So snapon.com slash OT if you want to register for that as well. And with that, that is the end. So thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with me. Hopefully we learned a few little tips and tricks on General Motors vehicles. Hopefully you'll join me again next week for our uh, air conditioning class. So with that, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Have a nice night and take care.